It was like you had one enormous brain with tentacles connecting New York to Tehran to Isfahan. Every transmission that came through had to be translated for cultural and linguistic content. It was the apotheosis of human soul level and cerebral capacity because it was empathic, analytic, contextual, and compassionate. You wanted us to relate to one another, see ourselves in the experiences of people whom we had never met, using the fact that we all loved you as the biofuel. You were our simultaneous avatar. Since 2011, the Backroom has been initiating conversations and collaborations between artists, writers, and scholars in Iran and the U.S., all the while questioning the nature of such exchanges. Okay, can you hear me uh, over there, Tehran? If you can, raise your hand. We are committed to developing alternatives to a standard and didactic educational models. Digital technology has enabled us to circumvent the bureaucracy of visa applications and the expense of travel. But open access does not mean equal access. And so we engage critically with how the technologies we employ as a medium for communication, as a material for artistic production, and as a means of distribution affects the work we produce. Over the course of 2014, the Backroom partnered with La Mama and Culture Hub in New York City, Sazman Hub Center for Contemporary Art in Tehran, and Mani Studio in Esfahan, and organized an eight-week workshop consisting of three-channel telepresent discussions between artists and writers. The goal was to share strategies for devising proactive engagements with marginalized spaces in Iran and the U.S. and discuss the challenges to enacting such efforts. Participants debated potential sites for interventions, discussed recent and ongoing artworks and curatorial projects, and read essays on contemporary art, space, and performativity that the backroom newly translated into Farsi and English. A touchstone for these conversations was Craig L. Wilkinson's The Aesthetics of Equity, Notes on Race, Space, Architecture, and Music, in which he characterizes efforts to challenge normative ideas about space claiming marginalized locations and making them, quote, something else, as spatial making do. But hold up, wait a minute. Then Hooks flipped the script on Foucault by saying that some of us do here and some of us do there, not because we're forced to, but because we want to. Together with translator Saleh Najafi, we translated this phrase into the Farsi Sukhtan wa Sakhtan, an expression attributed to Persian medieval poet Saadi. Like a candle, I will be consumed by the morning. There is no other way but burning and making. This colloquialism, burning and making, captures the twin actions required of adaptation and metabolism, opening up, but on our own terms, participating rather than surviving. We party to survive. We remember those days. Remember.
remember bodies moving on the ground with no lights. We remember grandmas, grandpas, moms, dads, uncles, and aunties, or whomever was there for us to party with. Yes, we remember the bombing strikes of Iran, Iraq, eight years of 80s war. We still remember. We must dance before we get separated by borders and papers far. We remember Ava Botice in energy. We're there in the living room with the other kids when we heard the horrifying sound of the bombing alarm again, vanishing our peace. My grandma, our survivor, the master of the parties, came in with her boombox, blasting Iranian pop with no grief. I remember her heavy breath, free moves, and a crying smile. I remember her washing over the bombing, washing over me. I still feel it in my spine. I remember my mom too, doing her nails at the corner of the room, horrified if the rescue team finds her hands out of the rooms with no polish, perhaps no wounds. We danced and danced in subways, emergency rooms, shelters, mountains, and the seas. In our cars, wherever we found a little room to breathe, we danced with our shadows in our bedrooms, in water, on the land, the air, and the moon. We danced down here, up there. We dance in public restrooms, rooftops, the mirror, everywhere. Even the room. We dance on the mountains and in the seas. We dance in each other's eyes. Even if no one asks us how we dare to rise once again with such ease. We only have danced. We learn it little by little. It's best to keep it low and real. We dance in our bloods, away from any policies. We dance with our bodies, lovers. Now let's claim the net, claim the streets. Only party animals. Live a life. O oh, success, our lords of power today are thy slaves, thy helots, our kings of wealth. Everyone grinds for thee, everyone for thee lives and dies. Th thy palaces of silver and gold are reared on the souls of men. Thy throne is mortised with their bones, cemented with their blood. Thou ravenous Gorgon, on what bankruptcies thou art fed, on what failures, on what sorrows, the railroads sweeping across the continents and the steamers plowing through the seas are laden with sacrifices to thee. I and the millions of innocent children are torn from their homes and from their schools to be offered to thee at the sacrificial stone of the factories and mills. The culture too and the wise are counted among thy slaves. Even the righteous surrender themselves to thee and are willing to undergo that hideous transformation. O oh, success, what an infernal litany thy votaries and high priests are chanting to thee. Thou ruthless Gorgon, what crimes thou art committing, and what crimes are being committed in thy name?
So if he has, if he has it spread apart, he can take two different locations in the room. Uh, I mean, I can't reflect you because I'm not capturing the light of you. Maybe
<laughs> Wait, I know better than to do that, but thank you so much, Ava. I got mesmerized watching the video and uh, for, forgot to be prepared. I got kind of lost, but that was so, so beautiful. And thanks so much. And we're also seeing lots of feedback from all of you uh, around the world who tuned in to, to, in, to experience this. Welcome and thanks so much. Um, I'm Peter Kern. With me on my, on my, on your right, is Olivia Jack, the co-host co of the Music Makers Hack Lab for CTM Festival. And then above me, uh, who's giving us this wonderful presentation, is Ava Ansari, who's I think you're in Detroit now, right? Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm talking to you from the sacred land of Wabitananong, Detroit from a Persian carpet. <laughs> oh, fantastic. On the corporate land of the meta, uh, meta entangled corporate. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that and acknowledge that as well. And then for free access to Wi-Fi and healing technologies. Oh, wow, okay. So welcome. Just to say a quick word about the Hack Lab, so you know the, the background of these inputs talks. Uh, this has been a program since 2013 well, with CTM Festival. Olivia was a participant and, and presenter uh, a couple of years ago before becoming co-host. And it's a, it's a program that invites participants from around the world to uh, create their own performance space, their own performances uh, in the context of the festival. So I think we say, hack lab and people imagine hackathons and people coding or making synthesizers or something but instead kind of what ctm festival got was uh hacking performance and hacking collaboration so there are diy technologies often uh of various types but the core of it is really collaboration so and uh sorry i just i got distracted because we got a word from control room that we can hear olivia breathing but that's good we like that olivia's breathing um <laughs> And uh, uh, so this <laughs> this year is a this year is a different kind of year in that you know we are here kind of in a different space, but we wanted to explore that space of the internet um, and and this kind of dissociated uh, 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 world that we're living in. So also listening in our audience, in addition to all of you who are CTM audience, we have the participants for this year's Hack Lab who start on Monday, the twenty fifth, and they are gathered this time virtually from across seven time zones. So instead of coming to Berlin, we will also all be doing the stuff that Ava has been doing with her program for many years now. So that's my quick spiel on Hack Lab, which I guess was accurate. Otherwise I would see a reaction from Olivia like, eh? <laughs> so um, just, to, just to kind of start, I assume that people will want to know even the basics uh, it, it, even if they read the description, the kind of basics of what they just saw, Ava. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, well, we saw lots of different context, content in that video and beautifully woven together in a performance. Um, 
what what was a what's the overview of what we were seeing? What there, there's some of your program in there, and then there's kind of artistic interpretations of the program as well. So what did we see? Absolutely, Peter. Yes, 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 yes. You know, all of my work is around carrying and capturing and conveying the poetic essence of uh, the co-presence. So this can be seen as a fluid, uh, unseen uh, quality that is kind of gluing together all the uh, efforts I have in this life and for what I think is my path in this lifetime. So this manifests in relation to the modeling for the programming, the uh, technology that is used in it, the technicalities around the whole production, the communication and the like reciprocality between the connections and uh, the ethics and principles of the programming, as well as using uh, the technology itself as creative material and um, working with all of this in a, a space that is initiated for uh, cultivating celebratory memories of transnational togetherness. So in all the um, visuals or like the wording that uh, you experienced now, that's been the intention to try to bring back uh, the uh, focus uh, into uh, the more organic uh, a space of uh, the kind of biological uh, survival needs behind the work that we do and uh, the, the craving that we have for it, the craziness of the hours mm -hmm. of not sleeping and the adrenaline of coming off of it for a couple of days and you know feeling sick stored a second for what might happen now and co-organizing so many different people and giving so much trust um into uh what a co-creative situation can uh lead us to so i think at the time that we are now in the world this is something very important to practice together uh to think about what are the ways that we could share our tactics and strategies but also be able to co-organize on a global scale i'm gonna stop now <laughs> that was good i really loved how you um showed also the behind the scenes moments sort of the like setting the stream up and mm -hmm. translating between languages because i think um so often and especially now i see so many um live streams where you just see kind of this finished pro product like finished pro product of one view and i i love kind of this intermixing of the the setup, the the takedown, the because all of that is sort of part of this process of of how do you work with people and and we're all kind of working it out, and that kind of leads into a question I have for you, which is um, I know you've been doing this for years, this collaborating and working together remotely, and a lot of people um, I know for the festival this is the first time the Hack Lab is sort of remote. Um, and I'm wondering, has this current moment sort of changed your approach to these things in any way or kind of strengthened some aspect of your perspective on on remote working and remote collaboration? That's such a great question, uh, Olivia. Yes, 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 yes. Um, first and most, I uh, boycotted all social media because I realized that there is no way that I can uh, move forward with the amount of uh, visual manipulation and uh, neuro uh, kind mm. of oppression that is happening and try to take my time really with, uh, you know, again, the, the main like, uh, urgencies that I had in my work since it's, it began. And, um, you know, it 
It is kind of like the moment that photography went viral. Everybody had a camera. Every phone became a became a camera. This is how it feels now. This is the time for telepresence technologies to go viral and become uh, more of an everyday uh, extension of our identities. Um, so obviously, there are many moments that you wish things were different. You wish that you know you have uh, maybe captured your own work better to be more uh, helpful for sharing methodologies, <laughs> to think about what you've done in the past. And I think emotionally also, it's been very, very, very um, heavy for me to go through like all the work that we've done, considering all the uh, social political things that happened during this time and uh, where we are now, thinking more about the environmental aspects of the work, you know, more than ever. So yeah, I am seeking space and time for uh, converse and uh, for uh, release. And, um, you know, I think that people who have been doing this work for a long time, this is our time to be able to decompress and think about, you know, okay, where the wave takes us next, because of it, uh, is something that we are sort of addicted to. So it's just a matter of, you know, uh, thinking about it uh, in relation to all the new kind of monopolized uh, uh, mainstream technologies that are coming out that's been very annoying um you know and uh just being a little bit more on our toes in terms of yes we gotta we gotta tap into some independent resources to creating more things like live lab you know olivia like things that are allowing us to have a cultural say have a static say have a have a decent you know, ethical say in the way we do things. I wanted to ask about that. It's actually so both of these talks have wound up becoming like uh, Olivia endorsements, which is great, actually. Um, so yesterday we had Hydra. Today we should explain what Live Lab is. We didn't necessarily set that out, set out to do that, but I think that that kind of speaks to the uh, collaborations and uh, that you're that we're building, right? So what is uh, what is well I guess uh, yeah. what is live lab and, live and lab. then okay. the other question is let's start with that yeah um, so live lab is a open source software that I've developed um, in collaboration with Culture Hub which is a um, an art and technology institute in New York City that works a lot with La Mama Experimental Theater in New York City and also with Seoul Institute of the Arts in Seoul, South Korea. And they've for many years have been working um, with telepresence and performance at a distance. And I've been working um, with them developing open source software to help theater performances happen at a distance. And this was all before the pandemic. And that's how I know Ava. And one of the things that's really exciting to me, I guess, is both of these speakers are people that I've met through these open source um, projects that I've worked on. And so um, to me, it's become this kind of social, the process of creating a software has become a sort of social thing as well. Right. Yeah, maybe you can describe, so because Abba, you talked about boycotting social media. So, uh, I mean, I think this time for a lot of people has driven people further into the dependence on some of these monopoly technology platforms. Um, how are you working with Live Lab? But also remembering our audience may be kind of unfamiliar with what you're doing. Um, what's what are you specifically working with, and 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 how do you build, especially now? How are you building those uh, uh, projects outside those those social media platforms? Yes. Um, so. You know, quickly, uh, we realized that at Poetic Societies, which is the uh, final project that I presented as a part of the presentation, Poetic Societies is a nonprofit uh, transmedia, transcultural network 
and it is dedicated to the uh, somatic sonic and scenic liberation of the oppressed bodies, meaning every human body. Um, so our work is very much based on uh, our wounds and our traumas from institutional living and uh, poetic society functions, space that is an anti-institutional institution, an experimental space for thinking about how we can uh, think of poetry as an everyday living essence for uh, different ways that we organize uh, artistically and politically. And um, what is important uh, in relation that what you're thinking of is that it intends to have to be this yoke. It intends to function as this organic creature that is uh, carrying people who do not want to deal with the capitalist time frame, mm -hmm. who do not want to deal with insane deadlines, people who are in need of a place to focus on their artistic path, their dharma in life, the thing that is their call, and they they want to be in a protected space and deal with that. So it's kind of a rehab from all the things that are out there, right? And um, yeah, in 2017, I was really tired and uh, exhausted from my institutional life, and I felt like I cannot move forward any longer if I do not have an ecosystem that is uh, responsive towards my basic needs. And I cannot jargon about things and not do them. So let's just be real about it. So that's how it started. And uh, we work for uh, creating, initiating uh, dynamic encounters between different people to enhance these conversations for thinking about what healing technology can look like. Um, and through the long-standing work and uh, collaborations that I've had with Culture Hub and um, La Mama, um, you know, I I was able to uh, have a, an early access to Live Lab as a uh, beautiful software that is just so uh, responsive towards the needs uh, that organizers have and. The fact that you have this open channel for call and response uh, with the designers and people who are behind it have done this work for such a long time, adds so much value to it. And um, it's just, uh, you know, ridiculous that we do not have more of these conversations and platforms. And I really hope for, for, for us to, um, you know, today, and moving forward, think about uh, all the people on this call now. You know, we are like 50 people, right? Thinking about, okay, what are the everyday practices of technological oppression that I'm experiencing personally? Which one I can liberate myself from? Which ones I ha can have a conversation with a friend about it and at least be aware of the impacts of them on my body? and my relationships with other people. And um, for us who are in the field or interested in this type of topics, also actively sharing informations around healing technologies, such as Live Lab, I think would be very essential for our time. Hmm. Hang on, we have a request from our participants. So participants can ask questions. Uh, nobody's asked any questions yet, so feel free to feel free to ask anything that you'd like to know. But there was a request that I don't match color-wise, so I have a surprise. Um, apparently, I do. Hold on. I yes. I look a little more red, like my camera's tilting blue more than everybody else's. But but yeah, so I do kind of match the red from everybody. There else should be a filter for my that. Uh, I wanted to ask. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they can color. They can color correct me in the. We uh, see the blood. Really. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask about a much sim simpler technology. Actually, I, I thought it was just so kind of beautiful the use of these mirrors in a lot of the presentations, in addition to the lights and things. But I, the mirrors I thought were, were were really effective. Was that a way to um, 
it was that that a way to kind of uh, sort of break up the uh, the the space between the two uh, the sort of two dis distance worlds um, for them to see themselves and um, I guess it has sort of poetic function but maybe you can talk about uh, what the significance of that was. Absolutely. So um, you know, uh, doing this work for ten years, I have some uh, formulas and some type of artistic uh, understandings of how uh, I do things that sometimes also end up to some algorithms in terms of how things connect. So one of them is the uh, law of extension or limitation. So in terms of connecting mm. spaces. Uh, you either can decide if you want to extend the space to another space. For instance, in the beginning of these workshops, uh, we tried a lot of different things in terms of the actual existing architectural elements in the spaces that could help us with thinking about co-presence in a more uh, kind of uh, sensory level. So uh, in our space, for instance, there was a long ladder there was a long ladder in the other space. There were some stairs we had. They had some stairs and different types of textures and colors and lighting. That you saw the red light was helping with the extension of the space so much. Or when we were working with the parachute, we had a parachute here. They had something very similar there. So this idea of like both the spaces in type of cocooning situation and uh, the extension of the audios and the sonic vibrations and the call and response with that that was just insane in terms of the possibilities for healing rituals with this work i just cannot understand uh why we are limited to this just commercial angle of what this can be but uh the limitation uh is also very important because um that kind of uh is where the idea uh, of more specifically also in terms of like the cultural moments the spaces uh, synergies that you do not necessarily need to share with the other other end of the situation because it would be irrelevant and in some cases in my case you know when i speak about my work in many situations occasions i get very discomfortable because there's always this shade of like the victimized iranian you know a woman in the room even if like you know you see me as who i am and all the work that i've done it's so deeply planted in people's brain that it just immediately comes up so let's think about it differently let's think about like what it means that we have a blind spot in uh, in this case, we had Tehran and Detroit that is only dedicated this part of the story, this ch chapter of the narrative is only for the audience in that room. The audience in the other side of the uh, space, meaning Detroit, do not need to see that because they cannot relate to that and vice versa. And the mirror uh, kind of functions as a hybrid space because it can both be an extension and be a limitation depending on uh, to what direction and what side of this uh, grid. So uh, it is also a very fundamental element for Persian poetry in terms of the connection to uh, truth, the uh, infinity, the uh, uh, ideas related to purity and uh, also uh, reflection. So um, the idea of framing different places and working with projections and other uh, elements that are like arising, rising from the uh, conversations between the people in the room is something that is um, kind of behind the the uh, question that you had. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what so what are you working on? I mean, just to kind of follow up on Olivia's question, what are you working on uh, this year with this project, or um, um, how how has it changed kind of in this in this COVID um, period? At least at least kind of talking to I mean talking to friends in Tehran, it seemed like maybe people have this kind of a different idea of um, of the experience for Iranians, but at least at least my my friends there were all kind of going crazy during COVID, just like the rest of us. Right, like so, also kind of caught up in this sort of isolation or finding it difficult. So I'm curious, kind of how how this may have helped, or even if there was sort of telepresence sort of between artists there, or, or how people were responding. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, 
So, you know, we think of these means as, as ways to, uh, to help with our life, help with us uh, going through it. So, um, yeah, everything uh, that has been done in that time was very much focused on uh, the, the ways that we understood world. Um, at this time, uh, our bodies are going through so much. We are seeking simple moments of uh, existential peace. So uh, mm. one of the very uh, beautiful uh, moments that I shared recently with uh, my dear friend and colleague Mona Agababai uh, was a sunrise at the south of Iran at the Kish Island. Uh, Mona went to the uh, to the Gulf, and uh, I woke up and uh, we observed the sunrise there together. And that is the land and the beach that I've never been to because it was always so accessible oh, so easily there so i left my country before being there so it was very emotional and it was an incredible incredible experience so i've been uh thinking more and more with the programming that uh, uh we have uh in relation to more like meta multiversal moments of uh deep uh transcultural celebratory memory cultivation you know, the experience of a sun uh, rise in that glory is something that is completely metamultiversal. It's not anything that you need to, you know, experience uh, with any type of inserted context. Um, uh, so, for instance, the remote healing festival has been a way for us to keep it strong and keep it going and keep the underground essence of our work. And, um, you know, we have been uh, doing more um, serious, like critical uh, community uh, meetings and conversations uh, to think about what serves us in our uh, goals for our work now and uh, what is more helpful for our people and community and our goals of like aligning this um, works from their localities to their uh, globalities in terms of how they can be helpful and functional. We have another program coming up, which is between uh, Detroit and Palestine that is focused on water issues. And uh, it also uh, focuses on uh, the history of Flint. And um, we are hoping to share more tactics and strategies for uh, storing and filtering uh, and harvesting water. Right, I was following that this week, of course, with uh, Detroit's uh, uh, sort of water outage issues that you all are having, um, which seem like they've gotten worse or worse this year in the middle of COVID, that there's even less, there's even uh, greater problems with water shut shutoffs and things. Um, how are, is that something that you're able to engage with directly? Um, in, in, in finding solutions to uh, to those problems? Or is it also at the stage where you kind of try to talk to Detroit or Michigan policymakers to change things too? Or I mean, even before we get into, into Palestine, but just kind of looking at what you're doing locally. Yes, that's a very good question. So uh, there are many powerful uh, water organizers in Detroit. And um, we have been doing this work of, uh, basically following the legacy and what's been already done by the indigenous people. And uh, mm. that work in relation to the work of the activists and organizers, that in relation to the work of the farmers, the red linings, um, the uh, impacts of um, the uh, city projects on how these things are manipulated and how deeply racially, uh, you know, corrupted. Um, so yes, uh, in a way you can say different programmings and uh, public interventions and curatorial projects of 
poetic societies are like providing more context for one another, supporting one another. So uh, we are working uh, on a series of uh, short films coming out uh, under our independent uh, forgotten networks, anti-oppression uh, media channel uh, that is focused on the impacts of uh, the decisions that were made for making freeways in Detroit and the transportation uh, uh, regulations and policies and uh, laws uh, on the way that the uh, black communities has been impacted and vanished. And uh, th that uh, as, an, as an important fundamental subject in ways that we think uh, we can uh, work with the um, already existing problems in the land uh, in relation to, we say the four sacred elements in Persian, water, fire, air, uh, you know, and actually there's ether too in like most of the yogi uh, teachings. Uh, the, the ether is also a very important essence. So I would say like in that sense, the poetry is uh, functioning in, in as that essence or ether for allowing us to think about legalities more in poetic ways. And to just finalize that chapter mm -hmm. and uh, share with you this other ex exciting news is that we are also working more now on poetic legalities and thinking of right and right and contacts from space of abundance and fear of loss. Thinking of what would that feel like if, you know, we receive a contract that comes to us that actually allows us to read it, to be a part of it. It tells us exactly how long it would might approximately take, you know, not in an ableist way, but like thinking of how long it would take for you to read it. And um, thinking of like, what would that look like if it's, if it's helping us to uh, bring more transparency and clarity in the way we communicate and make and do together. That sounds great. So we have no, we're, I'm not seeing questions. I think uh, the poetic and uh, um, imaginative and uh, um, deep uh, kind of ways of thinking about all these problems are sort of wash, washing over our participants. So uh, Olivia, I guess it's kind of you and, and me still asking questions. I don't know if you had anything to add since I got to tee you up since we have a few seconds of latency. I just wanted to say, I think it's a great, um, what you were saying, you've been saying about co-presence and also kind of these different experiencing the sunrise together is a really great moment for us in Hack Lab to think about this because we we just met each other and one of the first, um, we've only met on a chat platform so far. And one of the first things is that everyone has shared a photo of their space and told us a little bit about their space. And um, I've been, I, actually have been too shy to show my space yet because it felt kind of intimate or something but seeing everyone else's space um it does kind of there is this something a little more personal about oh we're there and so um we have a, still a week until we start kind of this intensive week and so um i'm excited to think about some of these things about how we sort of create space together um and and get to know each other so I guess that's not a question, but a, a thought. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe to turn that into a question, I was really curious. I mean, so we have the kind of poetic and practical sort of come together in all of these things. Anyway, that's what the Hack Lab is about. And it seems like that's a, a big part of what you're doing as well. I wonder kind of how you get started with these projects or sort of how you first kind of bring people in. We've, we're seeing a lot of very beautiful end results, but I know sometimes those first interactions can be quite challenging. So I sort of wonder where, where you start with kind of organizing and getting people involved. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, I would say all of my projects are coming out of necessity of something need, needed to be done. Um, I would say most of the time, uh, you know, I'm feeling uh, the, the like, uh, you know, the, the little like l layer of uh, grief on my skin thinking that i wish i would have put the amount of production uh labor that i put into this project into my own work <laughs> but if and in that sense when i say my own work is that 
uh, you know, when you do hardcore production work, um, your artistic practice sometimes in relation to how how you would function also in a situation that maybe is uh, taking care of you and you're not the one, you know, always taking care of everybody is is getting really uh, becoming becoming secondary. You, you might not have as much time for that. You know, all of you, I think, could could feel it and identify like we we're all like creative people thinking about different things different range of things that we're excited about but then you are the one who's like pulling this off you are the one who's the like uh person who everybody calls at 3 a.m so that that doesn't much live much space sometimes for your work but um yeah i i think that um in the majority of my work, the first stage and first chapter of it, uh, when I was living in New York from 2010, when I moved to the US to 2015, was focused on uh, specifically uh, enhancing uh, connections and collaborations between Iran and the US. When I moved to Detroit, which was because I needed to learn more about the U.S. as a country, I needed to learn the racist history of it. I needed to learn uh, the perspectives of uh, people who have had uh, life experiences that I could relate to. Um, so that's why I came to Detroit. And during the past six years, I have been exposed to so many amount of incredible uh, grassroots work by the Latinx community, the indigenous communities, uh, and uh, the Asian American communities, the Arab American communities, and uh, Polish communities. So Detroit is like a, a beautiful space where you can learn so much about uh, how people trade time, how people trade labor uh, for creating magical things out of necessity. It's not a trendy thing here. Um, it's, it's something that needs to be done. So that's what thrives me. And um, I really hope that we would be able to Think about what we do out of the box of the code and code uh, eternal, immaterial, intangible art, but more in relation to the actual impacts on our everyday life, the ways that we could think about, uh, you know, poetry and uh, art and beauty and truth as the fundamental essences of how we breathe and uh, share uh, together as human beings. Hmm. It's pretty hard to touch that, that. That's a good way to wrap this up. I'm going to quick, quickly look and see if there were any other questions that were coming in. Um, ah, okay. Actually, yeah, but people talking about the situation in Chile. So we have a, um, um, I mean, I think that some of the things that you're saying about these things coming out of necessity is something that should be relatable. To uh, to lots of artists and uh, um, but lots of lots of our lots of members of our audience and participants and, and artists too um, that that so so that much should be understandable maybe the the kind of larger structure of how we support artists in in festivals even this one is is not quite aligned with those kind of community uh, community efforts I'll switch tabs again before I... oh wait here's a question. How much does your multilinguality help you in multilinguality, right? I said that right. So it sounds weird as I say that. Uh, let me master my one native language. How much does your multilinguality help you in arranging poems or prose from Farsi to English and vice versa? Does it allow you to transgress limitations of language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, yes, yes. So it really varies and depends on what I'm doing with my voice and uh, who are the people who are receiving it and what is it that we want to create together. But in a uh, way, for instance, uh, because this was also a way for us to share more experiences for how the festival could be more uh, um, more, more uh, uh, 
I would say, uh, connected to the uh, different ways that you could connect uh, and create situations in relation to the participants as a temporary zone. Um, I kind of uh, shared a lot of the, uh, you know, actively engaged in space and off space situations that people are collaborating that are not necessarily working in long term. They're like in the temporary autonomous zone as hacking spaces. It's like that's the nature of the work. And um, so in a situation like that, as an interpreter, I have more responsibility to be able to convey what's going on on the other end of the room. But I also have more access culturally to what is going on at the other end because of the fact that I'm born and raised in that land, because of all the cultural codes that I receive that other people don't, because of the way that I have the income, in, uh, like other secondary means of being in communication with my uh, organizers and friends in the rooms that allows me to air, read the air in that room, to, to think about that's why like it gets very complicated sometimes when you are the point of contact because you receive so much information and then you have to process it and instantly uh, give it back in a meaningful way to the other side to keep it, the uh, energy and synergy going. Um, but in works that are more like uh, poetic, my independent work, uh, my creative work, I do a lot of improvisational work, uh, you know, as you see, like, uh, I kind of uh, work around whatever I do about 72 hours before and after in, in terms of like short uh, conversations and flows like today. So you saw like I recorded some parts of what we had today last night. Um, so, mm. yeah, I would say in that. And that way I have more freedom and sometimes I don't need to necessarily also do literal translation. Sometimes a word can uh, be translated to a color, to a sentence and uh, more meanings could be embedded. Yeah. Sorry, big topics. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I, and, uh, uh, this is what we always want from the inputs. Yeah, this is what we always want from the inputs talks is uh, uh, like so much stuff that we actually just kind of get, get thoughts start, started. I have one more question from the audience. Uh, from one of our participants, uh, in an age of hyperconnectivity, even more so during a pandemic, how have you? How have you made? Well, this question assumes that you have. How have you maintained a healthy balance of the physical and virtual world without sensory overload? And then I guess my question is: Have you done that? Well, that's a great question. Maybe we can uh, close the session together with a, a very brief, simple. Uh, somatic sonic meditation um mm. well out of necessity out of my back pain out of the uh ways that life and uh, in um you know dance performance and institutional realm and my my uh you know car accident in 2017 i got more than ever rooted into uh yoga practice so i actively practiced the ayangar BKS Iyengar style of yoga, and um, it has been uh, a part of my life, and it has helped me to uh, not only uh, maintain myself, but think about uh, the deeper connections and philosophies that connects the uh, internal and external realms. I think uh, we had a very beautiful moment over our emails exchanges when uh we were organizing this for you all i mean i did the le least work <laughs> possible <laughs> but um yeah um you know we were thinking about how we could find the best way for this such you know limited amount of time to share with you how, how this work could could transfer and be transported from a body level under skin level uh to on skin and then to you know uh different diverse skin proximities and uh temporal and spatial zones um so i think that's been that's been very very helpful not only for sustaining myself but also to completely opening new spectrums and realms of possibilities for where and what can be uh 
considered as a destination for this work. Great. And I think that that was our last question. So I think with that, we could. Did you want to do a closing meditation? To we sign could. Up? Thank sure. you, everyone, for turning, tuning in. And thanks to everyone who helped with the tech um, and to CTM as well. I'm so excited for the next weeks. Yeah, I should also thank my studio mate, Jamaica, who's responsible for also for, she's also kind of assembled this background. Uh, so that's another shared space. I don't actually play the, the bass or guitar, but um, so, and thanks to all of you. Yeah, thanks so much, Ava. So it sounds like a great way to end today. Beautiful. All right, everybody. Wherever you are, find the most comfortable position for yourself, for your body. You can lay down on the ground, connect to the earth. You can sit down straight on your chair. Inhale and bring your head down and look at your hips. Make sure your hips are level. Most of the time when we sit, we pay no attention to the alignments in the body so you know what what's your chair looking like like how you sit every day right um so make sure the hips are level and tuck your pelvic in and stretch your spine up elevate your spine all the way towards the sky imagine your crown on the top of your head and stretch up the crown imagine there is a string a golden line going from your root chakra all the way up from your crown connecting to the cosmos it is on that line that you balance and feel centered inhale deep and release your shoulders Allow your shoulders to fall down. Lead them away from your ears. Press your neck back just a teeny tiny little bit. There's a moment that you feel like your head is more weightless. Stretch up your neck. Tuck your chin a little bit. Raise your sternum up. Bring it towards your chin. Elevate your chest. Inhale, you can have your hands on both sides of your thighs or you can just have your hand palms sitting together next to your root chakra, placing them on your heels. If you're on the ground, you can have your hand palms next to your hips and your heels as close as possible, letting go of everything. Inhale, relax your jaw. Relax your eye muscles, close your eyes. Allow your eyes to fall inwards slowly. Your eye muscles are carrying so much tension, looking at different screens all times. Let them just relax for a minute. Breathe into your eyes, relax your eyebrows. Relax the eye muscles. You can do this whenever you feel very tired, looking at different screens, or in traffic, or in a meeting where you feel that your body is shrinking, or in a situation where you feel like what you see is more than what you can digest. Inhale again deep into your eyes. Relax your eyes. Send your next breath into your ears. Relax your ears. Allow my voice to come to your ears. Allow your ears to fall inwards. Let your ears go. Next inhale, 
Breathe into your mouth and relax your jaw. Let go of all the frequencies, vibrations in your mouth that are coming from your throat chakra, but you never got a chance to actually verbalize them. Let go of them. Bring your hand up if that is a possibility at this moment, at this time. It could be your right hand or left. Bring your hand palm in front of your mouth. Inhale. And in your exhale, say no, your name towards your hand palm. Keep the hand palm closed so you can feel the vibrations of your mouth. Feel how quickly your vibrations are materialized and manifested in real world. My name is Ava. In Persian, it means sound. Here I'm sending you my light and love through my voice at this time with all the appreciation that I have for each and every one of you and for all the love that I carry for the organizers of this work. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely, lovely time. Let's celebrate.